Amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. The clerk will read the next amendment. Page 4, line 9. Oregon and California grand lands, $122,043,000. Range improvements, sums equal to 50% of all monies received under sections 3 and 15 of the Taylor Grazing Act and from Bankhead Jones lands, but not less than $10 million. Service charges, deposits, and forfeitures. Such amounts as may be collected under Public Law 94-579 and Public Law 93 93-153. Miscellaneous trust funds, in addition to amounts authorized under existing laws, such amounts as may be con contributed under Section 307 of the Act of October 21, 1976. Administrative provisions, appropriations shall be available for temporary structures, buildings, and facilities to which the United States has title. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. We need one more. Clerk, the clerk will proceed with the next paragraph. United States Fish and Wildlife Service Resource Management, $1,099,055,000 to remain available until September 30th, 2013. Now I have an amendment at desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Dix of Washington. Under the heading United States Fish and Wildlife Service Resource Management, strike the first proviso page 8, line 19, to page 9, line 1, relating to implementation of subsections A, B, C, and E of section 4 of the Endangered Species Act. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to speak to his amendment. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. I rise to offer an amendment that would strip a dangerous writer from this bill, a writer that would seriously compromise the effectiveness of the Endangered Species Act. This is a bipartisan amendment I might add. I'm offering it with the uh, support of uh, Congressman Thompson and uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick and Congresswoman Hennebusa. Uh, the FY12 Interior and Environment Bill passed by the full committee a few weeks ago contains a direct attack on the ESA. I offered an amendment at that time to strike the provision, but the full committee rejected it. The provision would block the Fish and Wildlife Service that's in the bill from listing candidate species as either threatened or endangered, as well as the designation of the critical habitat necessary for species recovery. These listing activities are preliminary steps that the Fish and Wildlife Service must take in order to begin the recovery process. After those steps are taken, then the hard work begins. Without these important preliminary steps of listing and critical habitat designation, it would be impossible to develop a scientifically valid and legally defensible recovery plan for declining species. This funding limitation aimed at the heart of the ESA simply is postponing the day of reckoning. It is important to note that the bill does provide funding for the Fish and Wildlife Service to downgrade the protections offered to species under the ESA. After all, the goal of the ESA is to eventually delist recovered species. Delisting is the reward after all the hard work recovering the species. But we can't get to the point of delisting species without listing them first. My amendment would remove these restrictions on list, uh, listing and uplisting and the designation of critical habitat. Many critics of the ESA argue the law simply does not work. I would argue that the recovery leading to the delisting of the bald eagle and the American alligator under the ESA is a strong success. In the last few months, the gray wolf in the northern Rockies has been delisted in two states, and the Fish and Wildlife Service recently announced the intention to delist the gray wolf in the western Great Lakes. Other animals that are still listed under the ESA but have made tremendous recoveries, including the whooping crane, the black-footed ferret, and the California condor. In the Pacific Northwest, I am glad to report that are we seeing signs of healthy recovery for the ESA-listed salmon, although it will be a while before delisting could occur. Clearly, these, these examples show us the success
of the ESA, a, a, a law, by the way, that the American people overwhelmingly support. As for species listed under the ESA, they still are struggling. It is naive to think that a quick turnaround is easy when it took decades, if not centuries, for a species to decline. Also, it takes more time to recover long-lived species. Here is the situation that the Fish and Wildlife Service faces in the administration of the ESA. Currently, there are about 250 species that have been identified as potential candidates for ESA protection. Of that total, there are just under 30 species that are poised for listing in the near future. The spending provisions in this bill would block further activity to protect these declining species. And remember, if you delay listing too long, a species will go extinct, thus making a recovery impossible. And that is why some people call this the extinction rider. The Endangered Species Act is one of the most effective environmental laws ever written. Recovering species is hard, often long work, but it is a responsibility that cannot be dismissed like the Interior Appropriation Bill attempts to do. I know that many of my colleagues would like to drastically reform the ESA, but it would be a sounder path to do such a reform through the authorization process rather than accomplishing the goal with a few lines in the appropriation bill. And I see that the distinguished chairman of the Natural Resources Committee is here, and he is pledged to get to work on this important uh, endeavor. In closing, I will point out that this amendment is supported by former directors of the Fish and Wildlife Serve Service who served under President Nixon, Ford Carter, the first President Bush, and Bill Clinton. It is also supported by several hook and bullet groups, including the Isaac Walton League and Trout Unlimited. So I urge support for this amendment and uh, yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? Move to strike last, last word in opposition. The gentleman is recognized amendment. for five minutes. Madam Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment of my good friend from, from Washington, Mr. Dix. I respect my, where my friend is trying to go, but not only does this amendment not get us there, it's downright dangerous. Downright dangerous. Let me explain why. Since the Clinton administration and response to lawsuits and court orders that were crippling the agency's budget, since the Clinton administration, there has been a statutory cap on how much the agency is permitted to spend on ESA listings. It's been a statutory cap in place since the Clinton administration. A cap on critical habitat spending was added in 2002. The Obama administration requested new caps for petitions and foreign species listed in 2012. In short, support for ESA funding caps has, been, has had bipartisan support in Congress and in the White House and was in place when the gentleman from Washington wrote the Interior Bill and when the gentleman from Virginia wrote the Interior Bill. Those spending caps were in place. This amendment proposes to do away with funding caps altogether and gives the green light to those that have made a living suing Fish and Wildlife Service. As a result, the litigants will act, the courts will act, and the Fish and Wildlife Service's entire operating budget will be at risk of being raided in order to fund court-ordered mandates to list species and designate critical habitat. The service will have no choice but to raid other funds from its resource management accounts, which is already $146 million, or 12 percent, decreased in this budget. Having said that, the heart of the issue isn't about funding. It's about the fact that the Endangered Species Act is broken and is badly in need of review, revision, and reauthorization by the Natural Resources Committee. As I have said before, there's been about 2,000 species listed, 21 recovered. 2,000 listed, 21 recovered. And unfortunately, the Endangered Species Act has become not so much about saving species as it has been about controlling land and water. I'll give you an example. We all talk about the fuzzy and warm animals that we all like and all want to save. Nobody talks about the slick-spotted pepper grass, endangered. Nobody really cares about the slick-spotted pepper grass, except that it's listed, and you know what it does? It prevents cattle grazing on public lands and is used to prevent cattle grazing on public lands and move cattle producers off of public lands. That's the only reason that the slick-spotted slick, slick pepper grass 
is really listed. That's unfortunate. When you start using what was an act that everyone in bipartisan, almost unanimous agreement in the House and Senate was a good act, the intent of the Endangered Species Act is right, and we need to do it. We need to protect species that are endangered. Unfortunately, that's not what it's being used for today, and you can't get people to the table, the stakeholders, to do a reauthorization bill because there are groups that like it the way it is. They want to control land and water by using the Endangered Species Act. How do you get the message out to them that we need to do a reauthorization? The only way I can think of is you say, you know what, this has been unauthorized for 20 years. Now you talk about policy writers in this bill that you don't like. This is a policy writer that you're attempting to add. It's an unauthorized program. Just because we have continued to fund it for 20 years, that's not the answer. That's the problem. And we need stakeholders to come to the table to sit down with the Natural Resources Committee and write a reauthorization. That's what this is all about. Is it, a, it is a shot across the bow. There are 58, I believe it is, 56 or 58 programs in this bill that the authorization has expired. Somehow we need to send a message that we have a process around here. It's authorization, then appropriation not authorization, expired appropriation, and appropriation, and appropriation, and appropriation. It's the only way those things keep going on. We are trying to send a message. You will find I am supportive of reauthorization of the Endangered Species Act, and I am supportive of the Endangered Species Act as it was originally intended. But I would urge my colleagues to vote against this dangerous amendment which would undermine the Fish and Wildlife Service's budget because it would lift the caps that have been in place since the Clinton administration and Fish and Wildlife Service would have no other alternative but to raid their accounts in order to fund court orders, suits, and other things that would come along. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Uh, I rise to strike the last one. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. The, uh, I was going to wait till other speakers uh, spoke, but I felt it appropriate to uh, engage in uh, a discussion here with the uh, chairman uh, and to remind him, Mr. Chairman, that this bill includes funding for a multitude of expired authorizations. The Bureau of Land Management isn't authorized. Well, but you're funding the Bureau of Land Management because you like the Bureau of Land Management. The grazing program isn't authorized. Oil and gas isn't authorized. Coming yield? Yeah. The gentleman brings up the point I tried to make. This is a shot across the bow. Yeah, but All of these programs <laughs> need to be reauthorized. Re we had to start somewhere. Huh? <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, this shot across the bow goes right into the heart of the Endangered Species Act. So you're picking winners and losers. You could have picked any number of programs, but you like those. So, in, in fact, some of them you've increased funding for grazing subsidies, funding for oil and gas subsidies. But the Endangered Species Act, the poor species who are in danger of extinction, who can't speak up for themselves, they get, the tar they get targeted. They're the ones you want to make an example of. You know, not allowing listings or the designation of even the critical habitat that will protect endangered species doesn't change the fact that so many plant and animal species are at risk of extinction. There are 260 species that are in danger of extinction. But we're not going to protect them. The lack of critical habitat designations not only hurts those species at risk, but it leaves in limbo landowners and businesses that need decisions in order to make plans. We hear so much about uncertainty and how bad uncertainty is. This creates uncertainty. The twist of irony, the bill allows funding to be used to delist species or reclassify them from endangered to threatened, to delist them or downlist them, but no funds can be used for listings or to reclassify them from threatened to endangered. Even if they become endangered, we can't classify them as endangered. We can only downlist them. It's a one-way street.
a one-way street to less protection. I, too, would like to see the Endangered Species Act authorized. Maybe we'll hear from the chairman of the authorizing committee uh, why it's not being reauthorized. But this is not the way to, to deauthorize it. The fact is that, uh, uh, that this is legislation on important appropriations bill, basically. I thought we were not supposed to be doing that. But we make these poor endangered species that are at risk of extinction bear the cost of Congress's failure to reauthorize the Endangered Species Act. Of course I support the Dix Amendment. Not only do we have 260 species at risk of extinction, but we don't even know the entire scope of species that are, whose, uh, whose very existence is at risk, and we don't know either the role they play in the ecology of our planet. There are so many species that we're only now learning, for example, uh, many that, uh, that catch insects or you know, mosquitoes or whatever that maintain the population of other species. I do believe that every species has some role to play in the sustainability of the ecology of this planet. We don't know necessarily what that role is. But I do think we, we have some uh, idea that they're there for a purpose. And while they're there for a purpose, it seems to me he, we have a purpose, a responsibility of enabling that species to be sustained on this fragile planet. And to say that we can't do our, per, perform our responsibility, that we can't be, act responsibly toward these, these species is irresponsible. It really is an embarrassment to this Congress. And so I very strongly support the Dix Amendment. I would hope that we would, uh, uh, we would give species a break and get this language out of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman rise? Uh, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me make one point. This debate is not about the Endangered Species Act. It is not about the Endangered Species Act. I have to rise and oppose the amendment offered by my good friend from Washington State. I think that Chairman Simpson has brought to the House floor a bill that prioritizes funding to ensure that the core responsibilities and environmental protections are met in a broader sense. When it comes to the Endangered Species Act, this bill focuses on funding the actual recovery of species. It does this by one, continuing funds for recovery activities and doing that despite the fact that this bill has, that the ESA has not been reauthorized for 23 years, not 20 years, 23 years. And two, by limiting funds for lawsuit driven new listings and habitat designations. This bill sends a clear message, as the gentleman from Idaho said, that the Endangered Species Act needs to be updated and improved. It needs to be authorized. As I mentioned, it's been 23 years since this bill was reauthorized by Congress. A person can be born and graduate from college in an amount of time that has passed since Congress last acted to make serious responsible improvements to this law. Now, the gentleman from Washington acknowledged me on the floor earlier, and I will tell him, as a chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, which has jurisdiction on the Endangered Species Act, I can inform the House that this committee will be conducting robust oversight of the need to update this law in the coming months. The current law is failing to truly recover species, while it frequently hamstrings jobs and economic prosperity, like the gentleman from Idaho mentioned. And we will also examine legislative priorities. In my view, and this is important about this debate, in my view, the real obstacle to improving ESA is the fact that a number of groups are, invested in, are heavily invested in litigation mindset, a litigation mindset that prefers lawsuits against the government over improving the act and improving the recovery of species. These groups have filed lawsuits by the 100s against fish and wildlife and national marine fisheries. This bill, under Chairman Simpson's leadership, effectively halts these lawsuits by limiting any spending on new listings or habitat designation. 
This bill will allow the biologists to get back to work recovering species rather than responding to court cases. Both funding and personnel will be able to focus on the real work of being, bringing species back from the brink. By striking this, this provision, the Dix Amendment would reopen the litigation process. The same activist groups, Mr. Chairman, that file these lawsuits endorse this amendment. As we speak, they are waging an expensive paid advertising campaign on behalf of this amendment. Because they profit from these lawsuits, to me, it appears they are more concerned about the ability to go to court, get a settlement, and get paid than they are about recovering species. So I urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment. This bill strikes the right balance by directing funding to actual recovery of species, and it strikes the right balance by bringing a halt to litigation over new listings and habitat designations. This bill will create an opportunity where Congress can do its job to update and modernize the ESA. It's time that we take a thoughtful analysis of the inadequacies of this current law. Inadequacies that allow the ESA to be abused through lawsuits rather than serving as a, a true conduit for species recovery. And let me go on to say that, as the chairman, I think, did, said very well in his remarks, there is no incentive for the stakeholders to come and try to work out the differences or update this law if Congress keeps kicking the can ahead. That's what the issue is all about. I, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine, for example, that people really believe that this bill should be in place Yet when there is a major construction project here in the Washington, D.C. area, like the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, they waive the act. Does that make sense? Of course it doesn't make sense. And we don't get an opportunity, those of us that are impacted by, by, uh, by this act, get a chance to waive it. So I, it just seems to me that there has to be an update of this. The act has not been updated for 23 years. It's time to do it. And as the chairman of the committee has jurisdiction on that, I'm glad to work with the chairman of the Appropriations Committee on this. In fact, I'll work with anybody on this because I, true, too, believe that the species are, are very important, as the gentleman from Virginia said. But let's do it in a way that protects species and does not harm those uh, people that make a living from the land and or the water. And with that, I yield back my time. Well, time has expired. For what purposes, gentlemen? from Idaho rise. The question is on the motion that the committee rise. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted accordingly. The committee rises. Chairman? Mr. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union, having had under its consideration H.R. 2584, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the Committee has had under consideration H.R. 2584 and has come to no resolution thereon. For what purposes does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk a privileged report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will record the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 372, resolution providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 2587 to prohibit the National Labor Relations Board from ordering any employer to close, relocate, or transfer employment under any circumstance. Refer to the House calendar in order printing. Pursuant to House Resolution 363 and Rule 18, the Chair declares that the House and the Committee of the Whole and the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 2584. Will the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Herc, kindly resume the Chair. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 25. 84, which the clerk will report by title. 
a bill making appropriations for the Department of the Interior, Environment and Related Agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2012 and for other purposes. What purpose? When the Committee of the Whole rose earlier today, the bill had been read through page 9, line 12. What purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the amendment introduced by my friend and colleague, Ranking Member Dix, and in opposition to the broader FY 2012 Interior Appropriations Bill. This bipartisan amendment, I believe, is critical to restoring the long-time commitment to protecting uh, our most threatened species from extinction. The gentleman from Virginia is absolutely correct that uh, so many of these species uh, uh, our planet actually depends on. And uh, it is a symbiotic relationship that protects uh, our, uh, our, uh, our environment. Uh, the language in the underlying bill to prevent any funds from being used to list new species under the Endangered Species Act, I believe is short-sighted. It only serves to punish a successful program for preserving critical habitats. And this language is just one example of the extremely harmful policies uh, included in this bill. On the broader bill itself, in how it fails to help our economy and create jobs. I want to mention that in my home state of Rhode Island, our unemployment rate right now continues uh, to be the third highest in the nation at 10.8 percent. Right now, we need investment in our infrastructure and in our resources to create jobs and modernize our communities. New England is home to some of the oldest infrastructure in the nation. and It is estimated that our drinking water infrastructure will need uh, needs, uh, will, will cost over $400 million uh, over the next 20 years, and that our state has $1.16 billion in unmet wastewater needs. But instead of addressing these needs by investing in our communities and creating new jobs, this bill slashes both the clean water and drinking water state revolving funds by 55 and 14 percent, respectively, below last year's levels. In this time of complex and contentious debates about our debt and future fiscal security, I constantly hear my colleagues talk about the burden our actions will place on the next generation. Yet this bill would repeal and block implementation of two of the most important uh, laws that keep our environment safe, the Clean Water uh, and Clean Air Act. Now what chance are we giving our children to grow up and flourish if we can't protect the rivers and bays that they swim in and the water that they drink. I'm also very disappointed that this bill blocks the EPA from finalizing a rule reducing emissions uh, of mercury from power plants. Now last week, uh, members were down here on the floor speaking uh, about the tiny amount of mercury in light bulbs, yet today these same members are blocking a rule uh, that would keep our, our fisheries healthy and safe for consumption in addition to preventing 17,000 premature deaths each year. I don't understand how my colleagues on the other side of the aisle can be opposed to a small amount of mercury last week, yet today seemingly have no problem, no problem with much larger quantities of the same substance but being allowed to endanger public health. Now lastly, I urge my colleagues to fight against the nearly 80 percent cut in the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the lowest amount in its 45-year history. As many of us are well aware, hunting, fishing, camping, and other outdoor recreation activities are a great benefit to our economy, bringing in a total of $730 billion each year and supporting 6.5 million jobs. Now these numbers uh, bear out when you look at my home state of Rhode Island. Each year, 163,000 sportsmen and 436,000 wildlife watchers combined to spend $381 million on wildlife-associated recreation in Rhode Island. Now, we have incredible national wildlife refuges, which have been protected by the LWCF funding and which our families in, in my district uh, are offered an opportunity to enjoy beautiful parks, trails, open spaces at no cost during these tough economic times. Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that this bill reflects our values or our shared desire to preserve our beautiful nation. I believe we can and we ought to do better for our, our constituents and for our children. I urge my colleagues to reject this bill and to bring a bill to the floor that preserves our environment, creates new jobs, and protects our commitment to, the future, to future generations. I yield to, to the gentleman.
his statement. It's an outstanding statement. You covered this very comprehensively, and especially the part about infrastructure. There's a $688 billion wastewater uh, back, uh, backlog that was during the Bush administration. We should be putting people to work on those kinds of projects. The gentleman is absolutely right, and I appreciate him being here in late in the evening to uh, su su support my amendment. I thank the ranking member, and, and I want to just commend the gentleman for, for sponsoring this amendment and uh, uh, for his work on uh, the, the broader bill. Uh, it, this is the right thing to do to bring a uh, to defeat uh, this uh, the, the broader bill here. Bring a bill to the floor that uh, that really reflects our, our values. And again, I, I thank the, the gentleman uh, uh, from Washington State for offering this amendment. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. First, does the gentleman from Texas rise? Move strike, last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as has been spoken earlier, the Endangered Species Act is broken. What began as a tool to help scientists protect vulnerable populations of endangered animals and plants has metastasized into an economic straitjacket from which there is no relief. To illustrate my point, I'd like to share the stories of two species that make their home in West Texas, the conchal water snake and the dune sagebrush lizard. The conchal water snake was first listed as threatened on September 3, 1986. Since that time, the citizens of Texas have spent millions of dollars complying with federal mandates, performing surveys, generally advancing the knowledge of the snake's biology far beyond that which existed when the snake was first listed in 86. Today, there's little question that the snake's population is stable and exists in far greater numbers than during the, li the original listing. Because of this research, the service proposed delisting the snake on July the 8, 2008. This delisting should be a victory for the service and the supporters of the Endangered Species Act. Instead, it has collapsed into a maddening, saddening caricature, caricature of endless government bureaucracy. During federally mandated 10-year study of the snake, researchers caught and released 9,000 individual snakes. The data collected was the basis for the Texas Fish and Wildlife Commission decision to remove the snake from their threatened species list in August 2008. At that time, Fish and Wildlife declined to delist the species, instead requesting an additional population viability study to be conducted with, of course, updated data. Eight years later, in July of 08, the service finally issued a formal delisting proposal, after which has been exhaustive, thorough, and detailed review of all the best available science. Unfortunately, as of today, the service still has not completed action on its own proposal. Today, to the best of my knowledge, the final delisting rule is hung up somewhere with the lawyers in the solicitor's office of Fish and Wildlife. It's inexcusable that this snake persists on the endangered species list. Its continued, in continued inclusion on the list represents a significant commitment of federal, state, and local tax dollars. At a time when our financial commitments are under a strain at every level of government, dollars are wasted because of the failure of Fish and Wildlife to make a final decision on their own recommendation. But beyond the dollars wasted while protecting a species that the service supports delisting, I'm more concerned about the long-term impact this non-decision has on the public's trust in our federal government. By proposing and then failing to delist a species, the service is undermining the very reputation it relies on when it hands down drastic and painful mandates sometimes needed to protect a species on the brink of extinction. The dune sagebrush lizard is just one such species whose protection will require the service to demand significant and costly compliance measures from the landowners and communities where this lizard exists. Unfortunately, it's also a species that has paltry amount of science behind the support of its listing. In Texas, there are but a handful of places that anyone has looked for the, the lizard, and the service is unable to answer basic questions as to how many lizards exist today, how many are needed to support a viable population of these lizards. This might not stir up much trouble, except the dune sagebrush lizard lives above one of the most productive oil and gas producing basins in the lower 48. Its inclusion on the endangered species list would effectively, uh, would dramatically, and dramatically curtail oil and gas exploration across this vast patch of the Permian Basin until the Fish and Wildlife Service decides on how best to proceed several years from now. The oil produced on this land provides a livelihood for hundreds of thousands of Texas families, millions of dollars of support for the Texas University and public school students, and most importantly, it's used by energy by the millions of Americans. The Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed closing this land to development based on too little science and too little concern for the economic consequences. I believe that the interminable delay in, in delisting the concha water snake and the paltry science behind listing of the dune sage bust lizard is damaging the service's credibility as an honest steward of the powers its agents are entrusted with. Fair or not, the Endangered Species Act as, in, as implemented by Fish and Wildlife is viewed in my district as little more than a cudgel to beat up disfavored industries in large part because the science is often shoddy, species are rarely delisted, and the mandates continue in perpetuity.
I support the underlying legislation today because it, I believe in the, it is the best short-term chance to correct the imbalance in the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. The underlying legislation will allow the, the Fish and Wildlife Service one full year to clear out its backlog of concho water snakes across this nation. Free from new listing requirements, the service can focus on the recoveries of the species that are under its care and better managing the charges it already has. I hope the service takes this year off to pay particular attention to the dune sagebrush lizard and work to understand this animal better before it moves to close down thousands of well sites across uh, West Texas and the, energy price and, the, and the resulting energy prices that are crushing our constituents. Mr. Speaker, I oppose the gentleman's amendment because the amendment locks in failed status quo for another year and offers communities around this commu country, like mine, no relief from the arbitrary mandates of the, of the Endangered Species Act. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Northern Marianas rise? The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Speaker, I rise to express deep concern over the allocations in H.R. 2584, the Interior and Environment Appropriations Bill for 2012. To begin, the bill costs $1.7 million for technical assistance and maintenance assistance in the United States territories. This small amount of money pays big dividends in the islands. The Northern Mariana Islands was just awarded $1.2 million to, in technical assistance funding to develop geothermal resources to generate electricity. We pay up to $0.40 cents per kilowatt hour now because we have to buy expensive foreign oil to power our generators. Technical assistance funds are helping to develop our own domestic energy resources, and cutting this fund sends us in the wrong direction back into the arms of foreign oil interests. I do appreciate the small increases in the bill to fund water and sewer projects in the Northern Marian Islands and the other territories. I am disappointed, however, that the bill targets the Environmental Protection Agency for overall cuts in the funding that provides federal assistance to ensure clean air and water for all Americans. As the ranking member of Fisheries, Wildlife, Oceans and Insular Affairs Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I am also troubled over the allocations in this bill, which would be devastating for the environment and for the preservation of America's natural heritage. H.R. 2584 provides inadequate funding for the Fish and Wildlife Service at levels 21 percent below fiscal year 2011 and 30 percent below fiscal, the President's fiscal year 2012 request. The bill cuts, pro, cuts provide a meager $22 million in funding for the state and tribal wildlife grants program, 64 percent below fiscal year 2011 and 77 percent below fiscal year 2012 President's request. This is a program that makes it more, small investments now to avoid large expenses later. It provides money to states and tribes to take voluntary conservation actions to stabilize declining fish and wildlife populations now, and this helps avoid endangered species listings later. In my districts, these grants help implement a wildlife action plan, conserving wildlife and, I might add, creating jobs. The bill also cuts the Fish and Wildlife Service Cooperative Landscape Conservation and Adaptive Science Program, 35 percent below the fiscal year 2011 levels and 47 percent below the fiscal year 2012 President's budget. This program supports the work of federal, state, tribal and local partners to develop strategies to address climate impacts in wildlife on local and regional scales. The Northern Mariana Islands and other insular areas are on the front line of climate change. We face the impacts of sea level rise, ocean acidification and increasing typhoon intensity. We need this program to develop science-based tools and solutions to conserve natural resources and help us adapt to the many negative effects coming at us as the earth grows hotter. H.R. 2584 continues and also cuts funding for the National Wildlife Refuge System to 7 percent below fiscal year 2011 and 9 percent for the 2012 request. The National Wildlife Refuge System is the world's finest network of protected lands and waters. We have refuge in every state and in nearly every ter territory, including the Northern Run Islands. These refuges conserve our fish and wildlife resources, but they also have a huge economic benefit. Millions of people visit refuges each year to hunt, fish, and observe wildlife. The refuge system generates $1.7 billion in sales for local communities and creates nearly 27,000 jobs annually. Every dollar spent in the refuge system by the federal government returns about $4 to local communities. And we can assume every dollar we cut means $4 less for our local communities. 
I have introduced legislation, H.R. 2236, that would generate funds for the refuge separate from the appropriations to the sale of semi-postal stamps to address operations and maintenance backlog. But this is no substitute for money being cut in H.R. 2584. Also cut is the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is used to acquire lands and conservation easements from willing sellers and landowners to provide operational efficiencies and connectivity within the refuge. At, at the Fisheries, Wildlife, Oceans and Insular Affairs Subcommittee hearing this year, we heard from stakeholders as diverse as the Defenders of Wildlife and the National Rifle Association, who recognized the importance of Land and Water Conservation Fund, which I might add is generated by offshore oil and gas, gas drilling revenues. H.R. 2584 provides only $15 million to this program, 73% below fiscal year 2011 levels and 89% below the fiscal year 2012 President's request. I strongly oppose H.R. 2584, which rolls back necessary funding to support hunters, fishermen, recreationists and local communities who depend on the environment for their livelihoods and which undermines ongoing conservation, public health and environmental protection for all Americans. And I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of this amendment, which I have co-sponsored, that would remove a rider from this bill that would seriously compromise the effectiveness of the landmark Endangered Species Act, which was signed into law almost 40 years ago in 1973. The extinction rider in this bill is a sweeping action that will prevent the Fish and Wildlife Service from spending any money on listing new plants and animals under the Endangered Species Act designating critical habitat or upgrading species from threatened to endangered. At the same time, the bill maintains funding for delisting species, creating an incomplete and lopsided endangered species policy. Mr. Speaker, my constituents in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and the American people support the important mission of the ESA, and it's not hard to see why. Preserving animals and plants brings countless benefits to people, and the loss of a species can have dangerous and expensive consequences in the future. For example, the U.S. Geological Survey recently estimated that the loss of bats in North America would cost agricultural producers nearly $4 billion per year, including those in my district. We also never know which species of plants and animals may be important in developing life-saving medicines in the future. But the ESA's primary success to date has been to prevent the extinction of hundreds of species, including the American alligator, grizzly bear, and the gray wolf. Indeed, less than two dozen species have gone extinct under the Act, and most of these species were already doomed to extinction by the time that they were listed. Perhaps the most iconic among these species saved by the Act is our national symbol, the bald eagle. On June 20, 1782, our founding fathers adopted the bald eagle as our national emblem. On the backs of many of our coins, we see an eagle with outspread wings. On the great seal of the United States, on the seal of this very House of Representatives, and in many places, which are exponents of our nation's authority, we see the same emblem. Living as it does in the tops of lofty mountains and in river valleys as close as the Potomac, the eagle represents freedom. However, by the mid-20th century, the bald eagle was severely threatened and reduced to just 400 nesting pairs. Bald eagles were declared an endangered species in 1967 in the lower 48 states under a less co cohesive, less effective act. Then the ESA was signed into law, and as a result of this, on July 4, 1976, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service officially listed the bald eagle as a national endangered species. And thanks to the Endangered Species Act, the Fish and Wildlife Service upgraded the bald eagle to threatened status in the lower 48 states in 1995, and official removed it from the nationwide list in 2007. Today, after decades of conservation effort, the Interior Department reports that there are some 10,000 nesting pairs for us, for us and for future generations to cherish. Because in large part of the ESA, my children have had the chance to see a bald eagle in its natural habitat. 
This amendment will remove the funding restriction on the listing and limit the funding to what has been spent on these activities in recent years. Additionally, the overall funding amount for the ESA and related programs of $138 million is significantly less than in past years, including in fiscal year 2008. Mr. Speaker, decisions about wildlife management should be made by scientists, not by politicians. Preventing listing is not the answer. We must allow the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do their job and protect species while making improvements to increase the efficiency of this crucial program. As I close, I implore my colleagues to imagine if the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had been restricted from listing the American bald eagle. This majestic creature, without corrective measures, would have been lost only to books and to our national memory. We have a responsibility to prevent the extinction of fish, plants, and wildlife because once they're gone, they're gone forever. We can't bring them back. I urge support for this amendment. And the I yield gentleman back the yields. Of my time. The gentleman yield. I just I want to commend the gentleman for a, 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 an incredibly comprehensive and a thoughtful and credible presentation. I just want to, you, you mentioned the, the bald eagle. Just a few weeks ago, uh, my grandchildren were out at the Hood Canal, where I live, and on the beach, three e bald eagles came down and, and uh, landed. And it was like one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. And I just want to thank the gentleman for his support, his co-sponsorship of this amendment, and uh, I appreciate uh, your credibility and, and your forthrightness. Thank you. I will. But since we're talking about bald eagles, and in our state, uh, they're around. And I would invite the gentleman to come to where I live in the desert, in central Washington, where frequently in the fall, I, I won't say frequently, I would say every fall and winter, uh, we see bald eagles. Uh, it, they are truly a majestic bird. But the, but the point is, again, and I, I just want to, I really thank the gentleman for yielding. This debate is not about the Endangered Species Act. This debate here is about trying to get people together so we can make the Endangered Species Act work in a way that, is, that will, will be beneficial to everybody. So that we can repeat the successes that we've had, albeit the su successes are only 20 species, but nevertheless, we ought to be working that way rather than restricting and having restrictions uh, as the current act is. So I thank the gentleman for yielding. And I appreciate General the gentleman's remarks. I appreciate General the invitation General and the way to, uh, time has to, uh, to amend the act is a regular order, consent, not an appropriation. The gentleman has 30 seconds more. The gentleman's time has expired. I ask, you have a consent 30 seconds more for the gentleman. Is there objection? The gentleman may proceed. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation, um, but the, uh, the way to amend the act is in regular order in the committee, not necessarily through the appropriations process. With the gentleman yield? I, I do. As I mentioned in my, in my remarks, when I, when I spoke, that, that certainly is the tenth uh, of, uh, of the committee that I chair it has jurisdiction, so I yield back to the gentleman. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from uh, California rise? I rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment uh, before us today corrects a terrible flaw in the underlying bill, a provision that prohibits the endangered species from being listed as endangered. Now, this provision is so bad that it would be funny, but for the dangerous effect it would have on imperiled species on the brink of extinction and struggling to survive. The previous speaker was eloquent in his uh, discussion about the bald eagle. Let's think about what would have happened uh, had this, been, this measure been law 44 years ago. The American bald eagle, our national bird and symbol, would be gone. In the 60s, there were less than 450 bald eagles. But thanks to the Endangered Species Act, this national symbol was removed from the endangered species list in 2007, and now there are nearly 10,000 nesting pair of bald eagles. Maybe some of my colleagues side with those who wanted our national bird to be a turkey, but I think I speak for most Americans when I say I'm proud that we saved this national treasure, the American bald eagle, from extinction. Had this rider been, in, been the law of the land in 1979, the American alligator would most likely be gone. But because of the ESA protections, the American alligator wild population has grown to more than 2 million and continues to thrive.
helping local economies throughout the southeast. The Aleutian Goose is another example of the success of the Endangered Species Act. Back in 1967, there were no more than a few hundred of these birds. But thanks to the ESA, the Aleutian Goose was fully recovered and successfully delisted in 2001, with a population of more than 100,000 birds in 2008. So successful was the ESA recovery effort that the Aleutian goose is not only thriving, but also being hunted in my district. Just this past hunting season alone, 1,700 acres of land were made available to hunters by the California Department of Fish and Game, not only pleasing the hunters, but helping the local economy as well. Other animals that have made a tremendous recovery while listed under the Endangered Species Act include the California condor, the black-footed ferret, and the whooping, whooping crane. And of great importance to my district, we are seeing signs of healthy recovery for ESA-listed salmon. This impacts other fishing states as well. Ironically, this deeply flawed provision does allow funding for the Fish and Wildlife Service to delist recovered species under the Act. However, you can't recover, uh, remove protections for recovered species unless they are listed as endangered in the first place, and a successful recovery plan is implemented. This measure puts the cart before the horse. Our bipartisan amendment, which, was support, which is supported by more than 60 organizations, would strike this extreme provision. It's our responsibility to be good stewards of this earth and prevent the extinction of wildlife, plants, and fish. The sad truth is that once we lose a species, we'll never get it back. That's why we need to allow for science-based policies and recovery plans for imperiled species instead of allowing politics to drive listing decisions and activities. I recognize that some of my colleagues have strong objections to the Endangered Species Act, but placing a spending rider on this year's interior appropriation bill is not the answer. If real reform is needed, then let's have an honest debate in the authorizing committee to look at what's working and what's not working under the Endangered Species Act, and let's fix it. That's a far wiser course than including an extreme policy change to, that, goes, uh, that goes back on America's promise to protect our most vulnerable animals and plants and would not be supported by the American public. I ask that we support the Dix uh, Amendment, this bipartisan amendment, and make sure uh, that we take this extreme policy uh, out of uh, the underlying bill. I will. When he said this is not the proper venue in order to address the endangered species, that's been my argument too. I think it should be done in the authorizing committee. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, there is no incentive for the stakeholders to sit down if we continue to kick the ball ahead uh, and, and, and not uh, seriously look at the Endangered Species Act. And as the chairman said very well in his remarks, this is simply a shot across the bow, not only on this, but other unauthorized programs. So this is not, we're not picking on this, we are simply saying... We're reclaiming my time. Uh, this time, does. I ask the gentleman, shot. Consent, the gentleman have an additional minute. Is there objection? Gentlemen, for record, thank the gentleman. one minute. Uh, this is a shot. It's a shot, it's a shot at the endangered species, and uh, you and I both know how important this is in regard to the salmon uh, in our district, something very, very important, something that's important to our economy, something that's important to uh, the uh, ecology of not only our state, uh, but the ecology of, of the country. The gentleman yield? Uh, we need to work together, and uh, I suggest that we remove this and get to working the together. Gentleman I, yield? I, I do yield. Listen, we, we, we share that with the salmon, I, and I would just point out to the gentleman that the salmon runs in the Snake River and the, and the tributaries are coming back in greater number, which would suggest that the species is being recovered. And, and yet we are waiting on, on, on for, a, well, for a judge uh, to, to, would, to make would, a decision. Would you, yield, would you yield back? The gentleman controls and, the time, yes. And, and remember, you're very well aware of the salmon uh, issue and how there's been a number of attempts uh, over, the, over the matter of water uh, that if had been successful, had it not been for the Endangered Species Act, there wouldn't be any fish because without water, 
as you know, there's no fix. Well, gentleman, you know, I, I, I can't argue with the gentleman. I'm just simply saying that, that we need to look at, at this. It's been 23 years. Uh, one, uh, 30 seconds for the gentleman. Is there objection? The gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. Gentleman, you. I, I just want to close. That, that, that's what this argument is about. The argument is not about the Endangered Species Act. The argument about this is about the serious business of sitting down and reauthorizing an act that has not been reauthorized since 1980. If the and, gentleman and that's revealed, I suggest we, that we do it in the authorizing bill. I, I totally CO, agree. With, uh, I totally agree bill. with you, and I said that in my open remarks. The gentleman from Washington suggested that's where it is. I totally agree with him. I thank very much the gentleman for yielding. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? I rise uh, to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm here to rise tonight in support of the Dix Fitzpatrick uh, Amendment. Uh, I had voted for this same language in the uh, Appropriations Committee markup a few weeks ago. And, and I've heard, we've all heard some pretty compelling arguments here tonight about some challenges with the Endangered Species Act. And, and as has been previously stated by Mr. Thompson and a few others here tonight, I do, I do agree with those who have said that the proper venue for this, uh, this discussion is in the authorizing committee, and I have great confidence in uh, Chairman Hastings uh, that he would uh, take a, a, a thoughtful and, and a sincere look at the act to make reforms that I think many people would agree are needed. Uh, but again, I just don't think this is the right place uh, to do it. Uh, and uh, again, I support the underlying bill. I think overall this legislation, uh, this, uh, this interior bill, uh, while it's not everything to everybody, and certainly the funding levels may not be where some people would like, uh, you know, Chairman Simpson has, uh, uh, has done a, a commendable job putting a bill together, but I think that this language in the underlying bill uh, should be stricken as uh, proposed by uh, Mr. Dix and uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, so that I would urge my colleagues to, to support the amendment. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Wisconsin rise? The rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as one of the former co-chairs of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus and very active in that organization, I rise in support of the Dix Amendment and in opposition to the underlying bill. It's unfortunate that Ranking Member Dix has to offer an amendment in order to strip out a policy rider of this magnitude in an appropriation bill. We just had a short discussion about how this would be more appropriate in the authorizing committee for further vetting of this issue. And I think there are some legitimate issues that we need to get into, but not in the appropriation bill. This is one of many policy riders that have been jammed into this appropriation bill, from the assault on the Clean Air and Clean Water Act to allowing mining near the Grand Canyon, one of the great natural treasures we have uh, as a nation, and on and on and on. And this extension rider that was included in the base bill would prevent the Fish and Wildlife Service from spending money, any money, on listing of new animals or plants under the Endangered Species Act. So to claim that this doesn't directly affect and attack the Endangered Species Act tonight uh, is mind-boggling to me. Uh, and yet in my home district in western Wisconsin, I have a very beautiful national wildlife refuge, the Nacida Wildlife Refuge, with three endangered species located, from the gray wolf to the cardinal blue butterfly to the whooping crane. And because of the protection that they've had, they are now increasing in population, the wolf to the extent that they're on the verge of being delisted in Wisconsin. A, another success story. And the whooping crane is making a resurgence, all because of the protections afforded under the Endangered Species Act. And now to claim in this bill that we're going to prevent additional funding in order to locate those species, whether animal or plant or fish, from falling under the protection, is, this is not the appropriate vehicle. But there's even more in this legislation that's disconcerting. The deep cuts to long-standing conservation, land and water conservation program that has traditionally enjoyed bipartisan support is deeply disturbing. From an 80% proposed cut on the land and water conservation fa uh, fund, and I'm glad that the committee earlier this night adopted the Bass Amendment to at least restore $20 million to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. But why are we cutting anything from that vital program? This isn't even funded by the taxpayers. This comes from oil royalties, from a grand bargain that we struck with oil and gas companies so they can explore and extract these natural resources from our public lands. And they agreed that for the right of doing that, they would contribute to the Land and Water Conservation Fund funds that would be used then for the enhancement of conservation programs and the protection and preservation of public lands in this country. And to come with a bill now to cut 80% of that out of oil royalties does not make sense. Or the 7.5% cut under the wildlife refuge system. I know Chairman Dix has been a champion of the refuge system for many years. 
And it's a, it's a system that affects virtually every congressional district. It brings countless revenue into our district, plus jobs. And with the huge backlog of maintenance and operation, another 7.5% cut will put them in, in the hole. A $7 million cut from the National Park System budget. A 21% cut in Fish and Wildlife Service. 64% cut in the State and Wildlife Grants uh, Program. Yet, back home, some of the greatest conservationists that I know are my hunting and fishing buddies because they get it. They understand if we just go and use the resources and deplete it from the wildlife to the fish to the waterfowl, that there's not going to be that recreational enjoyment that so many of us get in the outdoor recreation community. And that's why it was no surprise that earlier this month over 640 outdoor recreation entities and preservation entities signed a letter to the chairman and the leadership and to every one of our office decrying the spending cuts in these programs that we have before us this evening. Because they know that these programs aren't something that you can just turn it off like a spigot. These programs re require the continuity of funding and the continuity of assistance in order to make the progress that, that, that's necessary. And so these draconian cuts that are being proposed right now is going to set back the cause of conservation, whether it's wildlife or land in this country, for many, many years. And that's unfortunate because these same people also under know, understand the economic impact that these programs have. Outdoor recreation contributes over $730 billion annually to the U.S. economy. It supports over 6.5 million jobs. One out of every 20 private sector jobs are affiliated with outdoor recreational opportunity. 8% of consumer spending. And in my own state of Wisconsin, uh, hunting and fishing alone supports over 57,000 jobs, $400 million in state revenue. So if we're really serious about addressing the soft economy we have now and doing what we can to get the economy on track, creating good paying jobs, this is the wrong place we should be looking in the budget for drastic cutbacks. I've been one of the leaders in this place for significant farm bill reform to, to get at the outdated uh, agriculture subsidies. I'd ask for unanimous consent for one additional minute. Is there objection? Gentlemen may proceed for one minute. Thank you. Now, for 